Greetings, nerdlings. Today we're going to be discussing the properties of water. So let's get started. So first of all, water is super important because, well, most organisms on Earth are composed primarily of water. So water has major properties that allow for all of the life processes within us to take place. So most of water's properties are due to its polarity, which allows it to form hydrogen bonds. So if you remember from my classes, I always have this little saying about hydrogen bonds. I always like to say that hydrogen bonds are easy to make and if you said easy to break, gold star in life. So what it means that water is polar is that it has a slightly negative charge on one side of the molecule and a slightly positive charge on the other, kind of similar to a magnet. So if you look at a water molecule, up top here we have oxygen. Oxygen has a higher electronegativity than hydrogen does. So it has a slightly more negative charge than our two hydrogen atoms do. The hydrogen atoms have more of a positive side. Now that whole molecule together is neutral, but it is polarized again. So the oxygen atom again is a little bit more negative and the hydrogen atoms are slightly more positive. So the oxygen has a stronger attraction for the electrons than the hydrogen does. And that's what makes it that negative charge. Water again is polar, meaning that it has little poles just like the magnet, and it leads to a huge array of different properties that allow us to live in the world in which we live. So because of its polarity, water molecules form hydrogen bonds with each other. Hydrogen is attracted to oxygen. So the hydrogen, which is slightly positively charged, is attracted to the negatively charged oxygen. So opposites attract. Again, if you look at this, we have one oxygen atom, and it's going to be attracted to that hydrogen atom. And vice versa, we have oxygen over here, attracted to the hydrogen down here. So it starts to form this matrix. And that's one of the really cool properties of water. This creates what we call surface tension. Now there are two factors that go into the concept of surface tension. We have adhesion, which is just like tape. If you think about tape, it's sticky. It adheres to surfaces. So if I put tape on my hand and I ripped it off, I'd probably rip off my tiny little hand here. So again, adhesion is the ability of water to bind to other things, not to itself. Just like tape, you stick it on something else. Now cohesion, is the ability of water to bond to itself or to other water molecules. And these two properties lead to the concept of surface tension. That's also what allows those little water bugs and water gliders to kind of coast along on the surface of water because of that surface tension. It's hard to break all of those bonds. Now, even though hydrogen bonds are easy to make and easy to break, lots of those together make it much more stable and much more strong, which leads to some of the other properties of water that we're about to discuss. So water is an excellent solvent. And I'm sure at some point in your science education, you've heard a teacher say that water is the universal solvent. Basically what that means is that so many different compounds can be dissolved or dissociated within water itself. So many substances such as salts and sugars so when you decide you want some sweet tea and you put in like 50 scoops of sugar or you're dissolving salt for a lab that your crazy biology teacher is going to make you do. So what makes water a great solvent? Well, hydrophilic, hydro means water and philic means to love or to like. So if a substance is hydrophilic or water loving, it's going to be able to dissolve or dissociate into water itself. So substances that have an attraction to water or are hydrophilic or water loving are said to be polar or nonpolar. What do you think? So those would be polar, meaning they have a charge. Just like those water molecules have a slightly negative charge on one end and a positive charge on the other where the hydrogens are, Different types of molecules that are going to dissolve in water are going to have similar properties. So something to kind of keep in mind is that like dissolves like. So compounds that are polar, just like water, 
They are also classified as hydrophilic because they love water because they can dissolve in water. So polar hydrophilic substances are going to dissolve in water. Now to the contrary, if we have some type of substance like an oil, lipids, fats, those aren't going to be very soluble in water. I'm sure, again, at some point in your science career, a teacher kind of had a little beaker of water and they poured oil on top of it and you've got this little layer. And that's because oil is hydrophobic or water fearing slash water hating. Those substances are nonpolar. And so they're not going to be attracted to those slightly charged ends of the water molecules, so they're not going to dissociate. They'll basically just sit there. So water also facilitates tons of chemical reactions within our body. So all of the different enzymatic reactions that occur in our body pretty much require water in order to function. And if you're thinking, you're looking at this and you're like, I remember that, dehydration synthesis, hydrolysis, yeah, it's coming back. So if you've watched some of my other videos, you probably remember these guys, tangle beads. I like to use them a lot when I talk about enzymatic reactions, as well as hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis. So within the body, we have all these reactions that are going on. Some reactions are building things, such as building polymers from monomers, so putting smaller things together. And other reactions are going to be breaking different types of polymers apart. So if I eat something that's really, really rich in starch, like potatoes, my body is going to need to break that down into smaller glucose molecules that can be stored into my liver. So if I want to break a molecule down, I'm going to use water through a process that's called hydrolysis. Now the word hydro is referring to water, of course, but the term lysis is referring to splitting. So hydrolysis, meaning splitting using water. So now demo with the tangle beads. So if we're going to pretend this is a polymer, meaning many, many molecules linked together, if I want to split that, I'm gonna go, I add water, and that process is called hydrolysis. Hydro meaning water, and lysis meaning to split. Hatch up! So this is also, for those of you that remember enzymatic reactions, an example of a catabolic enzymatic reaction using the process of hydrolysis. Now the opposite of that is if I have macromolecules and I want to form a larger macromolecule or a giant polymer, I'm going to use the opposite of that. I'm going to remove water. And that process is called dehydration synthesis. Now dehydrate is a term that I'm sure most of you have, have familiarity with. It's a loss of water. You're dehydrating. You get kind of shriveled. You dehydrate a plant. The leaves get all wilty. So dehydration is the removal of water. Synthesis, that word means to put together or come together. So opposite of hydrolysis is dehydration synthesis, removing water to form a polymer. So now we have the longer strand. Hopefully that kind of jogs your memory about dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. So water also has a high heat capacity, meaning that it has the ability to store heat and moderate temperatures by buffering those temperature changes. It takes a lot of energy to raise water by one degree Celsius. And it happens because water has something called a high specific heat. And again, it takes a lot of energy to heat it up. And it takes a lot of energy to cool it down as well. So this helps really moderate the temperatures around the earth, especially coastal areas and areas that are surrounding big bodies of water. Water also has a very high heat of vaporization. It takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water by one degree. So when water changes from a liquid to a gas, it removes heat from the organism, and that allows for evaporative cooling. So if you've ever been outside, and I live in Houston, as do some of you probably that are watching this. Now in Houston, this doesn't really work that well because it is so humid and we have so much 
water in the air already that when we sweat here, we don't get as much evaporative cooling as you do if you went to somewhere like New Mexico, which is where I'm from. I go take a run in New Mexico, I sweat, it evaporates, and I cool off. I take a run in Houston, and I just get hot and really gross, and there's no evaporative cooling going on. So water is also less dense as a solid, and this means that when water freezes, it floats, and it forms this insulating layer in the water beneath allowing life to exist. So when ice or when water freezes, the bonds almost get stretched out. And so those hydrogen bonds get spaced out a little bit more between all of these water molecules. So the ice actually becomes less dense than the liquid state of water. So quick summary so far of our properties of water. We have cohesion and adhesion. And those together, can give us the idea or give us that property of surface tension, and it also has to deal with capillary action. Water is a very, very good solvent, unless we're talking about hydrophobic compounds that are nonpolar. It is a fantastic solvent for hydrophilic substances that are polar. It has a lower density as a solid, ice floats, and it has a very high specific heat as well as a high heat of vaporization. So why are all of these things possible? Water is polar and it makes hydrogen bonds. So the properties of water allow for something that's called capillary action. And again, this is probably something you did in middle school or maybe your freshman year in biology working with these little capillary tubes. And it's the ability of water to flow into narrow spaces without the assistance or opposition to external forces like gravity. So basically you put a capillary tube with water and the water will literally kind of climb up that capillary tube. And that is because of the properties of adhesion and cohesion. So the water is adhering to the sides of that capillary tube, kind of grabbing onto it almost. And then the cohesion of those water molecules, meaning all those molecules kind of holding on to each other, it prevents it from coming off of the edges, so it doesn't rip apart the adhesive property. And so those two properties working together will allow water to raise. Now this works in a much larger scale when we talk about trees that need to get water all the way from their roots to their branches. So trees undergo a process that's called transpiration. So you open their little stomata, and you get an evaporation of water. That process is called transpiration. Well, when those plants transpire and they lose water, it creates this negative pressure system, and it helps to draw water up the xylem through the process of capillary action. Again, using the properties of cohesion and adhesion. Well, I hope that was helpful, and it was a good review of the properties of water. Stay tuned for more videos.